-hmm. Okay. Designer. Okay, okay, perfect. Yes. So it's a pleasure um, to have today uh, Ben Buchler virtually in Singapore. Um, maybe something from his background. So he has done his PhD on electro optic control and fund measurements um, already in 2002, so almost 20 years ago. And uh, then actually went on to ETH in Zurich, working in the group of uh, uh, nano optics. Um, on let's say near field scanning probe techniques uh, to characterize uh, photonic crystal wave guides and uh, uh, resonators. Um, then in 2011, um, he has been uh, appointed as a chief investigator in the Center for Quantum Computation and Quantum Technology in um, Australia and uh, has started there with this group. Um, on investigation and application of atom light interaction and uh, quantum technology in general. He's also a professor at ANU, and uh, today he will talk uh, about um, the interaction of um, or the, the interaction of matter and light uh, and how we want to actually apply machine learning. Please, Ben. Or let, let's let's get uh, sorry. Let's get first applause uh, uh, for Ben. Right, and yeah, please, please spend your time. Right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, it is a pleasure to be virtually there. Um, who knows, maybe, maybe, maybe 2022 will be the year that we're allowed to go places again, we can only hope. So today I'll tell you a story of um, our investigations of uh, interactions of, of lasers with ensembles of atoms, rubidium atoms, if, um, for our part. Um, motivated mostly by the idea of being able to store, trap, manipulate uh, quantum optical states that we um, encode into atoms and then read out again. Um, so to begin, um, we'll just think about photons for a second and the thing that we often like about them a lot is that they go very fast and this is great if you want to send information long distances because you can send the information very quickly. And that makes people who are building quantum technologies very happy. On the other hand, some people wish to do photonic quantum computation or manipulate photonic quantum states um, with the goal of building optical quantum computers. And a difficulty there is that photons do not interact with each other very much, at least in free space. And so this can make quantum technologists very sad if they try and build an optical quantum gate because it's extremely difficult to do. You need some way of uh, convincing the photons to talk to each other so that ideally we can have a single photon, um, the presence of a single photon mediating a large phase shift on a second photon. And if we can do that, we can build an optical quantum gate and um, nonlinear optical quantum computers. So the thing that we've been thinking about is, is adding atoms. So if we add atoms, then light can interact rather weakly at least uh, via nonlinearities in the atomic medium. Now, if we want to make the nonlinearities larger, then we need to um, play some tricks. And so one possibility is to engineer systems with larger nonlinearities like Rydberg atoms. In, in this case, people have had some very nice results with um, generating large, larger nonlinearities. Another possibility would be to engineer lo longer interaction times. So if the light can interact with the atoms longer, then you can accumulate a longer phase shift. And this is the idea that we've been investigating. And part of the reason that we've gone this direction is because we have a program in building optical quantum memories. So uh, one of the things that people have been doing for some years now is trying to figure out ways if you have um, quantum information in photons, you're using it for quantum key distribution or some uh, optical quantum network, Sometimes you want to be able to trap and store those photons and release them at a later time. You want to build a quantum memory for optical states. And this would allow you to, to increase the range of quantum key distribution in terrestrial fiber networks, for example. And so we're thinking ultimately about whether we can use our quantum memory to trap light, store light, manipulate light, increase the interaction time between photons, and even use the memory to build nonlinear systems that may enable in the future uh, quantum gates inside our memories. So motivated by this, um, first of all, we think about uh, how we stop and store light. Well, stopping light is pretty easy if you add atoms because 
a photon can come along and it can excite an electron from a ground state to an excited state. The photon's gone away, but uh, provided um, there's no spontaneous emission, in principle, so far, everything is coherent and any quantum information carried by this photon could, in principle, be retrieved from this atom or an ensemble of atoms. Um, but there's a problem there, obviously, which is the spontaneous emission. So if we just allow the for the electron to de decay spontaneously, a photon will be emitted, or perhaps the electron decays through some manifold of, of levels releasing phonons, and the quantum information will be destroyed. So spontaneous emission is definitely not a good thing uh, for quantum memory. We need to find a way of building a, a quantum optical atom system that allows light to be stopped and recalled, but avoiding any spontaneous emission. And so the technique I'll describe now is a, is a fairly old one, and it's the basis of our memory scheme. It's based on uh, photon echoes via controlled reversible inhomogeneous broadening. So what we have here, what I'm sort of uh, trying to illustrate here, is we have some ground state and excited state, and we've got these different, um, well, detune photons are going to come in with different detunings from this excited state here with this detuning delta. And the photons come in like this, and we get some absorption of these photons. And when photons are absorbed over here, what we're representing is a block sphere for this ensemble of atoms. And the different photons here with different frequencies, the red, green, and blue photons that I've illustrated, will cause uh, excitation on the block sphere, which I've, I've represented here as an excitation to the equator, just for convenience. Um, in fact, most of the time when we're thinking about these quantum optical states being absorbed by an ensemble of atoms, the excitations are very weak. So the block vector for the ensemble will be somewhere down near the South Pole, very close to the ground state. I've drawn it on the equator here for, for clarity. But anyway, we have um, some vectors on our block sphere and each of the atoms in our ensemble will have its own vector. And depending on the frequency of which um, of the light they've absorbed, they'll start rotating around the block, vector, block sphere at different speeds. So the blue one goes the fastest because it has the highest frequency, the red's the slowest, and I've, I've drawn this rotation here in, in the frame of this excited state. Now at some point, um, as I've just um, illustrated there, we're going to do a manipulation on this atom. And I'll just run through that again. We, um, at some point, what we're going to do is manipulate these energy levels by applying a Zeeman shift or a Stark shift or some sort of external field that shifts these energy levels around in, inside the atom. So when we do that, we want to do it in such a way that um, everything is, is switched symmetrically about this excited state. And then the evolution of these block spheres relative to the excited state here will be reversed. And eventually all of these vectors rephase. And when they do rephase, the photons are regenerated and the photons exit the medium. This seems maybe a little bit magical, but basically the idea here is that if you accept that when the photons are absorbed, everything is in phase, then as the all of the atoms in the ensemble dephase, the polarization of the atoms dissipates. If you can find a way to rephase these atoms, you build up um, your optical polarization again, and eventually you um, recall the photons from the medium. Now, this um, at this stage, we haven't yet found a way, we haven't haven't yet described a way of avoiding the spontaneous emission because of course if we're using these excited states if the excited state lifetime is very short then this technique won't work for very long and your quantum memory won't last very long so um, in order to overcome this we actually use a three level system for people working with who have worked or thought about electromagnetically induced transparency this level scheme will be very very familiar the key difference here is that we are working detuned from the excited state. So what we have here is a very strong control beam that I've uh, drawn here in yellow. So this is a big fat laser beam with lots of power in it. And this is the weak field which we wish to store inside our atoms. And the existence of this very strong field allows a Raman absorption between these two ground states. And so in the end, we end up with a two level system that really is created by the existence of this control field and the two level system is made up of two ground states. If we turn off the control beam here, we decouple these two ground states and in principle then the quantum information can be encoded into the coherence of these ground states and last a very long time. So this is the scheme that we use. Um, we call it the gradient echo memory 
and it works like this. We have um, our pulse of light coming in and our control field coming in, they come in at the same time. Now the pulse of light, it will have different frequencies. A short pulse will have many frequencies, a longer pulse will have fewer frequencies. But either way, the different frequencies in the pulse will be absorbed at different positions along this ensemble. The different frequencies of the, the light will be divided up into its Fourier spectrum, and the Fourier spectrum will be, spectrum will be, will be written um, along the axis of our memory because we have a gradient in the absorption frequencies here. So in practice, in our scheme, what we do is we use a gas of rubidium atoms and we apply a magnetic field gradient along the length of our atomic ensemble such that we have high absorption frequencies at one end and lower absorption frequencies at the other end. And this means our memory kind of exists in a Fourier space. So the different Fourier frequencies written into the different parts of this ensemble. We can turn the control field off and now we have a stable memory, if you like, with the, the information encoded on the ground states here. So these two levels that I've drawn here are really schematic. What I'm actually referring to here are these two different ground states. We can reverse the gradient now. When we reverse the gradient, we start evolving the motion of these locked spheres back in the other direction. So the red, the, the red frequencies here will catch up to the purple ones over here. Turn on the control field and the light will be re-emitted as a photon echo. So this is really quite interesting if you think about this as an E field. So this is the, the spatial axis here vertically and the time axis here. The light comes in traveling at the speed of light. It's slowed down and then becomes dark as it's stored. And then at this point here, we reverse the gradient and, and turn on the control field and the light is recalled traveling in the forward direction. And this is the, the temporal profile of the pulse I've used in this model here. If we look at the, so this is the, um, the electric field of the, um, the E field of our system, the optical field. If we look at the atomic polarization, which in this key, case means the coherence between our ground states, for this pulse here, which we see is a kind of a modulated Gaussian, we see the Fourier transform. So in the center here, we have the carrier, and on the side, we have the, the two sidebands. Um, so we take the cross section here, what we see is the Fourier um, transform, or at least the um, spectrum of our, our pulse. And these properties will be important later when I talk about stationary light. So the other way to look at this would be if we've got a Fourier transform here, what would happen if we take the Fourier transform of every slice along our memory and we plot that as a function of time. So our light would come in here and then it's absorbed into our atomic ensemble. And the vertical axis here now is actually this K axis is showing us how far our block sphere has dephased. So the higher we go in K space, the more our vectors are separated. If I look at the cross section through this um, mode now, I see the temporal profile of our pulse. And that's because I've taken the Fourier transform of this image here and got this thing back here. I've thrown out all the phase information as well, by the way. We're just looking at the absolute values of these things. Anyway, now at this point here, we're returning the gradient around. We can turn it around slowly or quickly, it doesn't matter. And when everything is rephased down here at k equals zero, the light pops out again. And um, that's how our memory will work. So now I'll go, go and describe the properties of our memory experimentally. Um, the first experiments I'll describe here were done in a cold atomic system. So we have a very long magneto-optic trap, about four centimeters long, about 10 to the 10 atoms, and a peak optical depth of around 1,000. So this is a very high optical depth system. It's very difficult to measure these optical depths. There's some controversy as to how you go about measuring that the best way possible. Um, but we claim anyway that our optical depth is, is actually that high. And we store, the, the light will be stored along the length of this atomic ensemble, um, where we have this very high optical depth along the length of this cigar-shaped ensemble here. So this is showing the recall efficiency as a function of storage time in our cold atomic ensemble. This gray is the input pulse. And then we have progressively decaying recall um, efficiencies as the storage time increases. The peak efficiency here for short storage times is around 87%. Um, this shows you the decay of the storage time as a, a function um, of, of, sorry, decay of the storage time as a function of time, sorry, storage efficiency as a function of time. So we have a one on E time of around a millisecond. 
um, for our best case scenario here, certainly we have many cases where the storage efficiency is above the no cloning limit, which is 50%. So if we were storing a quantum state in principle, we would argue as long as we were recalling with efficiencies in this regime here, regime here, we could be assured that the version of the state we're recalling from our memory is the best possible representation to the state that was stored. The angles here, um, what they are is the angle between the probe and the control field. So we have the best storage when the probe and control field are absolutely collinear. And if we have any angle uh, between them, we start to see faster dephasing. Um, the, the peak storage efficiency is the same, we just have faster dephasing. Now, the reason you want to have an angle is actually because you want to be able to separate the probe and control um, more easily. If you have no angle, you need some sort of way of filtering out this strong control light from the very weak probe, which may be a single photon state. So the fact that we, if we want to have long storage times and maybe working on zero degrees here does add a level of technical difficulty in terms of filtering out the light, but we are able to do it. It's just, just a bit harder. Um, for reference, an ideal fiber working at uh, 1550, um, so the, the ideal sort of peak transmission efficiency for a fiber, if it were to put a pulse of light into a fiber and have it go around and around and around as a storage medium, this would be the, the lifetime of the storage in that fiber. So our atomic system here is um, clearly better than that fiber. Um, in fact, our memory here was the first atomic memory to beat this fiber limit, so to be able to store states with above 50% efficiency for longer than a simple fiber loop, an ideal fiber loop. Some other properties of this memory. Um, one is that because we have this neat Fourier um, property, we can do a lot of manipulation. So if we, for example, here we have an input pulse, we could change the steepness of the gradient on recall and we can compress this pulse or expand this pulse. These dots here are, are experimental data. That the reason for the points is because we're doing a heterodyne measurement, it's a technicality, but we can stretch pulses, we can um, expand pulses, we can shift the frequencies of the pulses. Um, we can even change the order in which the pulses are recalled. So we have pulses one, two, three, and four, and we can recall them in the order four, three, one, two, in this example here. Um, and we can do this by switching the gradient backwards and forwards and pulsing the control beam on at the right times to recall the pulses that we want. It's also spatially multi-mode. So we've done experiments where we've stored different spatial modes and showed that um, the memory is more or less agnostic towards the spatial mode which we're storing. So these are some of the properties of the memory. What we're going to do now is use some of these properties of memory to play some tricks uh, that look towards uh, increasing the nonlinear interactions of fields inside a memory. So the memory as I've described it so far <clears throat> can't really help with increasing nonlinearities because this stopped light, that is the light that it, we map into the coherence of the ground states here, it's dark. Once it's stored, if we turn the control beam off, there's no field, there's no optical power at all inside our memory, it's, it's completely dark. And so we can't do any cross phase modulation if there are no photons. So um, this stopped light, the, the memory itself, um, you could map a coherence, you could map a, a quantum state into the memory, but if you want to be able to manipulate that and change the phase of it, we need some way of uh, having a bright field inside our system. So there's a bit of a problem there. Um, and the thing we're going to do now is look at a way of creating a state of stationary light inside our memory. So how does this work? This is what, this is the, ex, the outline of the experiment that I'll describe. So instead of a single control field here, we're going to have two control fields. Um, but first of all, what we're going to do is map some light into our memory. So we're absorbing the light into our memory here and we're going to reverse the gradient for some time such that uh, all of the block vectors have been rephased. So in principle now, if we flashed on our control field, the light would be recalled. We're not going to flash on the control field. We're going to leave the control field off and just allow our um, atomic polarization here, our coherence, <clears throat> to sit there in a state that is ready to be recalled. And in fact, we're going to turn the gradient flat. And now we're going to turn on two control fields in these two directions, they'll be detuned symmetrically about this excited state here. So one above and one below. What happens next is that some light leaves the memory and some atomic polarization is left behind in the memory. 
And in fact, when this spin wave here, this coherence is left inside the memory with these control fields on, there will be some circulating light going backwards and forwards between these um, peaks and troughs of the leftover spin wave. And so this is light that is trapped by the atomic coherence. And we're going to look now at a way to try and maximize this effect. So we're going to store a particular pulse in our memory. It's a modulated Gaussian. It's going to leave uh, an imprint at either end of our memory. So it's going to cause some coherence at the high frequency end here and the low frequency end here. So we map that into our memory. We jiggle the, the gradients backwards and forwards and get all of the um, um, uh, light ready to be ready to be recalled, but um, we're not, gonna, not going to recall it. And then we're going to flash our two control beams on. So what happens next is we're going to have some stationary light inside our system. And we're going to think about what kinds of spin waves and what pattern of atomic coherence will um, uh, is the best choice to maximize this trapped light. So um, stationary light um, has been observed before in science fiction. Um, for anyone who remembers um, The Force Awakens, there was a scene in which um, our intrepid hero here shoots a um, some sort of laser blaster, we think, and there is definitely a state of stationary light in this movie. Um, it's not the kind of stationary light we're making. For one thing, we can see it. And this is definitely not the case for our stationary light because if we could see it, it's propagating to our, to our eyes and it's definitely not the stationary light that we're looking for. Um, but it did, did get us thinking about um, representations of, of stationary states of light in science fiction, at least. So the people responsible for this work, um, Jesse Everett here is um, the principal driver of this. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of his ideas and his experimental work that I'll be describing. So um, he was now working at OIST in um, Hokkaido in Japan. Sorry, not Hokkaido. Um, the island right down in the south, what's it called? Okinawa, that's it. Okay, so here is our very complicated level scheme. We have um, some uh, probe light that we're go is going to be circulating inside the memory. So these fields here, the blue and the yellow, these are the, if you like, the quantum states or the, the weak states that we're circulating the trapped light inside our memory. And these two fields will be the control fields that we apply symmetrically above and below the excited state. And this is the situation that we have. So here we are, first of all, mapping um, our pulses into the memory and writing the coherence. In this case, um, we have a positive coher a coherence that is in phase at each end of our system here. So we write the coherence in, we flip all the gradients around, and then we, when we turn the control field on, like this, so the control field is turned on, what we see is that this spin wave starts to uh, decay, and it gives rise to an emission of light that leaves the memory in two different directions, so these two pulses here. But we have some, some light left over behind in the memory. We're going to try a second situation here now where um, instead of the atomic coherence being in phase at each end of the ensemble, it's out of phase. Now in this case, when we flick on the control fields, what we find is that very little light leaves the memory. In fact, um, negligible light leaves the memory if you have everything perfectly matched up and you have just um, some light that is trapped inside the memory. You have probe fields that are basically being emitted by one end of the memory in this spin wave here, absorbed over here, then re-emitted and sent back in the other way. So the light is circulating around inside. Um, so this is a situation where we have a pi phase shift between the spin waves at each end of the ensemble. We have light circulating around like this. And in time, if we ignore any um, absorption or decoherence, this is actually a stable situation. So that's stationary light. If we have these two pulses at each end of the spin wave in phase, what happens is you turn on the control fields, some light is emitted, the spin wave uh, reorganizes itself, it changes shape, and you have some light left over behind in memory. So the spin wave, the atomic coherence, self-stabilizes to find a situation where you have 
uh, light that is trapped inside the memory. And the condition is actually pretty simple. What you want is that the integral of this green curve here, which is the atomic coherence, if that, if that curve over integrated over space um, averages to zero, then you'll have a system with stationary light and um, no more evolution, no more changing of the spin wave. So here we start with um, equal area in this green part of the curve and here in this green part of the curve here. So when we turn on our control fields, there is no evolution because you've already achieved this condition here. In this situation where we have uh, the two pulses in phase, we turn on the control fields and it evolves to a state such that the integral of the spin wave is zero over the length of the ensemble, and then it is stable. So this is a self-stabilizing system. It's really kind of, kind of neat. We did an experiment um, where we put the control fields in on each side with some angle in between, um, and we have detection on each side of the system and a CCD camera here that where we image the atoms from the side. An imaging beam goes through the ensemble, and this way we can actually record the pattern of the atomic coherence. And that's really important because as I mentioned, we can't see the stationary light. We have to, the way we observe, we do have stationary light is by comparing the pattern of the atomic coherence to the model pattern of atomic coherence um, in our system. So here are some raw images. This is um, the spin wave on each side of our atomic ensemble. Um, I'm gonna process it just to, so we can see it a bit better. And this is with a pi phase shift. This is a movie now, so I'll play the movie. So first of all, we write in the coherence, we flip on the control field about now, and we see that the pattern doesn't change. We do have some, some decay because there's some decoherence in the system, but the pattern of the spin wave that we write doesn't change. If we do the same experiment now where we have um, the pulses at each end of our system in phase, we write something that looks like the same pattern, but these are actually out of phase. We see when we flick on the control field there, just there, there's a very sudden change in the pattern. And then um, we have a, a stable situation beyond that. And so to summarize those videos, this is what happens um, when we have, this is the experiment and this is the model. This is showing the expected spin wave behavior. Um, so this is the, the, the model here, this is the experiment. This black line here is the model, the green data is the experiment, and that shows that when we flick the control field on, which happens around here, oh, sorry, control field, control field is turned on at this point here, that point is there. When we turn the control field on, you can't see any real change in, um, in the system. We do in our model have some bright field, which is shown here, this is now showing the, the field. Um, and inside our memory, we would expect to have circulating light like this. If we compare it to the case where we uh, have a, pi, a no pi phase, pi phase shift between the spin wave at each end, when we turn on our control field, we see this change that we saw in, in the movie. And this is our model here. We compare the model and the experiment. And in this case, we still have stationary light, but it's nowhere near as much. So the point here, I guess, is that we've found a confirmation or a, a, a um, configuration rather of our atomic spin wave that allows us to maximize the amount of stationary light that's trapped in our system. If we can trap a quantum state in this stationary light configuration, we could imagine it becoming the basis of uh, some nonlinear physics scheme where because this light is trapped in our memory and circulating and interacting with our atoms for a longer time, we can enhance the um, cross phase modulation. So onwards to nonlinearity, we have plans for single photon storage, which I'll actually describe in a moment because we have done some of that now. And then um, combining single photon storage and prototype photonic gates. So um, before I get to the single photon stuff, however, we'll describe some uh, machine learning work as well, which I believe Pinkoy may have mentioned um, last week when he was here because he works um, uh, in the same building as me on some of the same experiments. We collaborate. Um, but one of the features of our uh, magneto-optic trap is that it has a very high, high optical depth. And one of the ways we've been maximizing the optical depth of our magneto-optic trap is by using a machine learning system. And I should point out, so Aaron is a postdoc with us now. Uh, Harry now works at Google. And this work really is, is theirs. So this is our magneto-optic trap. Um, we have a lot of different things that we, we 
can do to trap the atoms or manipulate trap the atoms. There are um, coils, magnetic coils. We apply current to these coils to generate magnetic fields. We have uh, light that we use to trap trap the atoms that provide the optical molasses. We have a repump beam. The repump beam, if the atoms fall into the wrong state where it becomes dark and invisible to the trap, it pumps it out of that state so it still interacts with our, our trap. And the point here is that magnetic optic traps have been around for a long time, but you have billions of atoms all interacting with each other, colliding with each other. You could, in principle, write down the billion equations and try and solve them and say, well, how do I choose the best parameters for tuning these magnetic fields, tuning the trapping beams and tuning the repumping beams in such a way that I maximize the number of atoms trapped, minimize the temperature of the atoms that are trapped and minimize the volume in which they're trapped. This is a really hard optimization problem and it's really not something that is tractable numerically. And so for years, people have done it intuitively. They said, well, I'll move the magnetic fields around in such a way that it compresses the atoms down slowly and change the, the, the frequency in a way that doesn't heat them up too much. But we thought, well, what if we could use a machine learner to try something crazy and new? So what can we use a machine learner to try and optimize? There are lots of different things we could try and optimize. Um, because there are lots of different stages in our um, memory scheme. We've got the loading of the atoms, the compression, the polarization gradient cooling, the optical pumping, the memory storage itself. And then there are different metrics we could use to try um, as a cost function to, to parameterize the performance of our machine learning. We could look at the optical depth of our ensemble. It tells us how many atoms, the temperature, the recall efficiency, the storage time. So we're going to start with these two parameters, the compression and the optical depth. So we're going to try and um, catch the, the highest number of atoms, compress them to the smallest space, and we're going to measure the optical depth as the cost function that uh, tells us whether we're, we're doing this well or not. So this is the human optimization. This is the um, scheme that when we learn how to build many magnetic optic traps from a, a neighboring group that does um, Bose-Einstein condensate work, uh, they helped us build a trap and they taught us how to trap and cool atoms, and this is the kind of scheme that they used. So the trapping uh, frequency, um, it's red detuned from, from the atomic um, resonance. And we didn't change that frequency when we optimized this, we just left it at constant. The repump detuning, however, we did change to change the repumping efficiency over the, the trapping time, which here is 20 uh, compression time, which is 20 milliseconds. Um, this is done to reduce heating. And also we, we think to re reduce heating anyway, that's the, the, the reasoning we use to, to, to follow this, this um, particular um, pattern in repump detuning. And we increase the coil current. So we increasing the strength of the magnetic fields to try and compress down the atoms and, and um, put, push them into a smaller, smaller volume. When we applied machine learning, this is the solution it came up with. And you can see it looks rather different. Um, it really looks kind of random. And um, we wondered why. What we can say is it's extremely successful. It traps twice the number of atoms and it's caught all those atoms and compressed them down after about 10 milliseconds. So it catches twice the number of atoms and it does it in half the time. I'll give you some idea of um, the learning sequence. Um, this took about an afternoon, um, this particular sequence I'm showing. So what we've got here is a function of time on this graph is the coil current down here the repump detuning and the trap detuning. And the way we've parameterized this, um, we've parameterized it into one millisecond blocks. So the machine learner has control over 21 different values of the coil current, 21 values of the repump, and 21 values of the, the uh, trapping detuning. And we'll choose a value for each of these three parameters at 21 different time steps. And that's how it's we divide up this space um, piecewise. So there, it's a 63 parameter space because there are 21 different possible positions for each of these three different things. And so, for example, this would be one um, run of a magnetic optic trap where the coil current would follow this curve as a function of time. The repump would follow this curve and the trap detuning would follow this curve. And at the end of it, we see how what our optical depth is. We measure the absorption. We see whether we have a higher, higher high optical depth or a low optical depth. And so now what this is showing here is um, a whole bunch of different 
run. So each time we add another curve, set of three curves here, on the right hand side, we're looking at the optical depth. The lower the value on the screen there, the more atoms we trap. The shading on the left hand side here, the brighter the colors, the more atoms we've trapped. So every now and then we see a bright flash, so this, this one here, for example, that and um, some of these brighter flashes here correspond to catching more and more atoms over here. And so we see as our learning sequence goes on, we find some sort of um, pattern that seems to uh, correspond to having a higher number of atoms trapped in our system. So that's the end of our sort of afternoon there where we finished doing our machine learning runs. These are the top 20 solutions. And they're all pretty similar to each other. Some values don't seem to matter that much. This value here, for example, doesn't seem to matter very much. Um, others seem to matter a bit more. This is the best solution. So it correspond to, I think this one here, I'm not entirely sure. Um, and this is the thing that caught us the most atoms. It didn't really very much, very, didn't really very, didn't really vary a lot between the top 20 solutions. They're all fairly similar. Um, so, where are we? Okay. So this is also, um, we've got a movie showing the human solution. We can see as we change the coil current and everything, the magnetic optic trap here as we image it from the side, it slowly compresses and we get some more atoms like that. If we compare that to the machine learning solution, we see that it jumps around quite a lot as we flick all of these different values from rail to rail. And that's one of the striking things about this solution, I think, is that it really is pushing the parameters. There's not a lot of places where it chooses to be in the middle of our parameter range here. It's really either at maximum or at zero or either end of our range, sort of neg negative maximum, or positive maximum, um, which has inspired us to build a new magneto-optic magneto trap that can push higher coil currents and bigger detunings um, for all of our fields so that we can see if we can get a better solution if we um, just push the system a bit harder because we really don't know. It's also interesting to think about what the physics here might be. Um, we will, when we're doing more experiments in the system, one of the things we will do is rather than parameterizing it in terms of 21 time steps, we'll parameterize it in terms of frequencies. So we'll choose um, different Fourier frequencies um, across this, this, um, this time series here and see if there's a particular frequency that stands out. See if we can sort of find a correspondence between important frequencies and um, properties of the atomic ensemble. Um, but exactly what the physics here is, is a bit of an open question to us. Um, if anyone has any good ideas, I'd love to hear them. Um, but this is the solution we found that works. It's fairly stable from day to day. Um, you can see it, it did vary a bit um, between different runs. If we did the run on a different afternoon, it would look qualitatively perhaps a little, a qualitatively a little bit different, but the, the features will be pretty self-similar. It'll go from rail to rail, and there'll be some sort of periodicity in the way that it drives these different fields. Um, so there's the difference in the uh, human and machine optical depth. Okay, and the next things we're doing for machine learning. So we work in this center with other people working on quantum information systems. Um, I've already mentioned that we're going to try different basis functions that might illuminate physics. We're going to try applying the machine learning uh, to the memory protocol itself, see so if we can improve upon our 87% efficiency. We've also been applying it to silicon quantum qubits with the University of New South Wales. So they're working on silicon quantum computing. They have a lot of processes when you're doing two qubit gates with silicon that look really similar to the kinds of things that we do. We're applying pulses and different frequencies and different timings and shapes of pulses. So this kind of machine learning system um, is something that we think will also help with their, with their schemes as well. So the final thing I'll talk about is storing quantum states. So, so far all of our experiments have been done with uh, coherent states or sometimes weak coherent states with just a few photons to show the quantum compatibility of our memory. And that's one of the things we have done is we've stored coherent states with, you know, uh, order of one photon and shown that when we recall it, we haven't added any photons. And if we haven't added any photons, we're not adding any noise. So that's good. But what about storing actual single single photons, actual quantum states. Um, so one of the best known and characterized sources of single photons are the spontaneous parametric down conversion sources where you use a nonlinear crystal, 
you take a photon with frequency two omega and you split it into um, uh, photons with uh, frequencies that add up to omega. So if it's symmetric, you'd have a pair of photons each with frequency omega. So the question that arose is, can we get this um, spontaneous parametric down conversion source, which is a great source of single photons and match it up with our memory? And there are a lot of technical challenges to overcome here. First of all, typical spontaneous parametric down conversion sources have a very wide bandwidth. If you don't do anything to control them, there can be many nanometers, but the bandwidth of our memory is of order of megahertz. So we have a rather special source of um, parametric down conversion, which is built inside a narrow bandwidth cavity. So that means a very long cavity that narrows the bandwidth of our single photons. Of course, the single photons then will still come out in all the different free spectral ranges of our cavity. And we're going to select out a single one of those. And in the end, we end up with a rather large experiment. So we have a second harmonic generation system, which is pumping our spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, source that gives us pairs of single photons. And we have um, an etalon that's doing some filtering here to select out a single free spectral range. And we have more cavities uh, filtering to select out just the frequency that we want. And one of this uh, pair of photons goes through here and is sent to um, an APD here, which is used as a trigger. So if a single photon makes it through this cavity, through this filter cell, which again gets rid of some of the, the light that we don't want, this would be a trigger to say a photon has been sent into our memory. This one here is just used as a monitor for all of the other photons that are at the wrong frequency that bounce off this, this cavity. The other thing we have is our memory. So we have a control beam that comes in. So it's our control fields at different frequencies. So we mix the control field and the single photon at the mirror of a cavity. The memory cell here, rather than being a hot gas, is actually, uh, rather than being a cold, laser cooled atomic ensemble, it's actually a warm vapor cell. So it's about sitting around 80 degrees. This is easier to run at a higher duty cycle so that we can get um, more single photon experiments done. The duty cycle of our cold system is order of a Hertz. This is just a lot quicker. The efficiency, however, is very similar. So we've seen 87% efficiency in a warm gas as well. And then finally, we have some more filtering and some more filtering and some more filtering and then detection of um, our uh, single photon that has been stored in the memory. The filtering here is really uh, mostly getting rid of the control beam because there are a lot of control photons here. Um, the power here is the order of a watt, thereabouts. The single photons obviously are much uh, weaker than that. So we have to do a lot of filtering in order to get down to the single photon level. And these are the results. So this is a single photon input, um, a pulse of the single photon. We trigger, as I said, we, we trigger the detection of the single photon in the memory arm from the single photon that has been detected by the, the trigger APD. And this is a single photon output that has been stored in our memory. And you'll see that it's changed its shape rather a lot. And this is something that we know can happen in our memory if the bandwidth of the photon is not matched perfectly to the bandwidth of memory. So if the photon has a broader bandwidth, then the edges of the memory where the gradient isn't quite perfect, we can get some distortion. So when we recall, we can stretch or compress the pulse. So we can compare this to a coherent input where we use an APD to shape a coherent pulse with many photons to try and make it the same temporal shape as a single photon. When we recall that, we see something which is um, similarly distorted, but not all the same. Like we see a pulse of light coming out here um, that we don't quite understand. But we do see some of the light um, here that looks very similar to our, our single photon pulse. This light here is light that leaks through the memory that we think is just outside the, the bandwidth of the memory. This light here is something we are yet to properly explain. So the point here is that bandwidth matters. And I mentioned at the beginning, there's a big technical challenge here of trying to match together the spontaneous parametric down conversion source with this fairly narrow bandwidth atomic memory. And this is kind of uh, pointing to how challenging this really is. So these experiments are extremely difficult. Got here some data for different storage times. Um, so the black traces uh, show the, the, the red data rather is a single photon data and the blue sort of um, bar bars here, the light blue bars show the single photon recalls. The lines, the black line and this lighter blue line here are the equivalent coherent experiments where we try and do the same storage and recall um, times for the coherent states with matched um, timing. 
Now we've got an issue here as to how we try and um, calculate the efficiency of our memory because of this distortion. So one measure of the, the memory efficiency was we count all the photons that come out of the memory, all of the ones that didn't come out with the input pulse. That would be one measure of the, the uh, efficiency. Another measure of the efficiency would be all the photons, at least with the control field on, because that's when we expect them to come out. Um, so that would be good because we have some photons coming out here when the control field is off, which is a bit strange. Another measure would be all the photons that are lined up with the, um, the coherent pulse. So this is when we would expect uh, photons that follow this temporal shape to come out based on our coherent experiment. So there are three different possible ways of parameterizing the, mem the memory efficiency for a single photon system. Um, and you can see how that, that goes here. So in either case, the efficiency for short storage times appears to be around 80%, and then it decays at different rates depending on how you want to measure the efficiency. So this story, I guess, is, is uh, in progress. We haven't, this work is sort of, uh, still we're still writing this up and um, uh, getting, getting a paper together. Um, we're not quite sure yet. Um, I mean, the practicalities of trying to measure, um, match together spontaneous parametric down conversion source with this atomic memory, uh, I would describe as fairly epic. Um, it's maybe a cautionary tale in some ways as to what not to do. Having said that, what we do have here is really high storage and recall efficiency for single photons. Um, that's something that we can be uh, fairly happy with. So that's actually the end of my talk. Um, here is an old picture of our group. Um, necessarily all because we haven't all been together for quite a long time. Um, and with that, I will finish and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot for the nice presentation. Um, so maybe yeah, let's let's start with uh, some some questions. Um, so anybody can unmute uh, themselves and and sort of um, and directly ask if there any urgent questions. Maybe, maybe um, so I start because uh, since since I'm unmuted. Um, so you you have you have shown initially let's say in the, in the in the first part this experiment where you had let's say storage efficiency of let's say um, always eighty percent. Mm -hmm. Independent of the parameters you are varying, um, why 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 is it actually limited at this this eighty percent? So what what or let's see what is the experimental the experimental difficulties? I mean atoms are extremely nice systems, photons are perfect mm -hmm. systems. Why is it not perfect? Yeah, um, in principle, um, there's no reason why it shouldn't be higher than eighty seven percent, which is the ceiling we've hit, and you know I think. Probably it's mostly coincidental, but when we did the warm gas experiments some years ago, the highest efficiency we achieved was 87%. And when we did the cold gas experiments, the highest efficiency which achieved was also 87%, albeit with Magic a longer storage time. And so we think the reason, um, at least in the cold gas, we've um, narrowed down the reason for that limit to being um, non-uniformity of the control field. So when we... Uh, when we are doing these storage, you know, when we think about these things in the model, it's all just sort of one dimensional. But if you imagine you have a, a two dimensional system and you've got your probe that's stored in the middle, you try and make your control field much bigger so that the control field is uniform across the transverse mode of your probe. But we think the non-uniformity of that control field is actually the main limit at this point. And so um, to fix that, we, um, I think we'll just expand the control field a bit more, which means finding some more power and also taking care of uh, um, the uh, optical quality of the, the, the glass cell that we go in through, because if there's any sort of um, uh, fringing or distortion of the light through the, those glass faces, then that can give us some sort of interference fringes or some transverse behavior across um, uh, the story, the, the, the transverse mode. And we think that's actually the, the, the main factor at the moment, as, as best we can tell. Um, but in principle, there's no reason why this couldn't be uh, in the mid to high 90s. You are limited at some level by spontaneous emission because although you're working in a regime where you're detuned from the excited state by up to a gigahertz um, for the control field, there will still be some spontaneous emission. So that is also a limit. But that's certainly not the limit that we're facing at the moment. Okay. So we have 
good reason to believe that um, we can improve the efficiency further. So what could you, I mean, uh, probably it's very um, uh, difficult to put it in, but uh, that they would actually in SLM help to, let's say, try to alter the phase of your uh, control feed that sort of you can, let's say, um, uh, correct for any errors from your, from your cells, from your, let's say, cell um, surfaces? Yeah, um, maybe, yeah, that, that's, that's one way of doing it. If we have some sort of phase plate control of it, um, and the first thing we need to do is really characterize really well what distortions the control field is mm -hmm. undergoing as we go through our cell. And maybe it was as simple as just changing the angle or something a little oh, bit yeah, so that we're yeah. less, less prone to etaloning. I mean, the, the one surface I think in our glass cell is AR coated and the other uh, couldn't be. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're hoping that we can somehow um, overcome that problem. Um, I mean, 87 is not bad. I'm, I'm not oh, yeah, yeah. That. No, no, but it's, 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 it's sort of this, this, it's been a bit of a bugbear for us as well, because it's been stuck there for a long time. Um, and for a long time, we're like, well, why can't we make it better? You know, we've done everything that the model says we should do. And in the end, I think it really just comes down to some really nitty gritty experimental details as to how we max out at that level. But um, I think, we, I think we can get past it. I'm, ho I'm hopeful in 2022, if we're allowed back into our lab, probably we can, we can finally get past that level. Yeah, great. Thanks. Um, are, are there more questions? I'm sure there are. Yeah, I have some questions. Uh, I have two questions actually. Ben, so first of all, uh, thank you for the talk. It was very nice. Uh, my first question is, is very technical somehow. Is uh, I mean, so to have a large OD, you you saw um, you saw a sketch of your, of your setup, uh, mm -hmm. and I, I understood that is some kind of two D mode shape with with some kind of tapping coils, right? Yeah. So you have yeah. something very elongated. But at the end, the, the, the mod beam should be extremely large as well. So uh, I was wondering, uh, is it really the best solution to have some large OD or just a big 3D mod will do the same job? Yeah, so um, the, thing we, the thing we're really interested in doing is trying to, well, a couple of things. So we want to try and put as many atoms as we can along the length of our beam. Mm -hmm. And we also want to try and have a fairly narrow beam because if we're interested in, in maximizing photon photon interactions or anything like this, you want to try and reduce the beam volume. Um, so, I, I mean, at the moment, actually, um, Anthony has been borrowing a Bose Einstein condensate that we have in our building and trying to do some experiments in these BECs that are extremely tiny. And so he's focusing really hard into these systems and looking for cross phase modulations in the BEC. Um, so I think if we had a, a larger 3D mod, you might be able to trap a very large number of atoms, but that wouldn't necessarily give us the highest optical depth for these narrow beams um, that we're trying to manipulate. The other reason we like to have a very long trap is that with our gradients, um, it gives us more room to play. If we have a system which is shorter and you're trying to put a gradient across it, then you need to have a much higher um, sort of a rate of change of magnetic field in space. But if with a longer, a longer magnetic optic trap, you can afford to have a, a gradient that is a bit more spread out and a bit more controlled. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the reason that we went that way. There may be other ways of doing it. Um, but ultimately, I think the, the, our thinking was we have a, a, a fairly narrow beam and we want to put all the atoms along that beam. And every atom that we have that is not in that beam is an atom that is, is wasted to us. And so we think, well, what we need is a long, skinny magnetic optic trap. Okay. I have a more, I mean, I mean, a question, another question about, I mean, this stationary uh, light. Mm -hmm. I, I don't fully, uh, fully understand, in fact, because, I mean, so basically you, you start with store, but you have basically two colors, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so it's two frequencies. Yep. One will be stored at the beginning when you start at the end. Yep. And then uh, uh, somehow, um, after that, you said that, so there is a stationary wave. So I, I was wondering, I mean, what, what, what kind of frequency? So it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's an electromagnetic field, first of all. It's not a spin wave because you don't see uh, nothing between the two. So, but how is the frequency of this wave? I mean, and why it doesn't interact at the medium, at the medium, at the medium uh, also? I, I don't really understand mm -hmm. uh, what, what kind of spectral properties has this stationary wave. Sure, yeah, okay. So the, the, the thing that's happening there is that um, um, everything is dark until you turn on the two control fields, one from each side. 
and the two control fields are detuned from the excited state symmetrically. And so the control field that's detuned um, above the excited state will interact with um, one side of, so you have these, you identified these two different colors. It will cause, um, I, I guess, stimulated emission from that spin wave and start to deplete that spin wave. But mm -hmm. those photons will be reabsorbed on the other side of the memory because you have the other control field coming from the other direction and you get the reabsorption on this side. And you end up basically with light circulating inside the memory between these two um, uh, atomic coherences. They're, they're playing ping pong. One sending light in this direction with one frequency, the other one sending light in the other direction with a different frequency. So you have, I mean, if you measure the group velocity of these these photons inside the, the spin wave, the group velocity would be zero because the pulse is stationary. Mm -hmm. But the phase velocity of the photons moving backwards and forwards is fairly close to the speed of light because you have these two spin waves at each end, but in between, um, the atoms are not interacting with the photons at all. It's only where you have these coherences where you have the absorption re-emission at each end. Um, so it's it's kind of, I mean, you know, another way of doing this would be to have a cavity, right? You have you know, mirrors and that, that reflects light backwards and forwards as well. But the the fun part about this, I think, is that you can imagine um, manipulating the properties of the mirrors because you've got this, they're, it's built into the atoms. And so you could, you could move them around or you could have different mirrors in different places and have different parts of the ensemble interacting differently with different photons. We're not quite sure of what all the possibilities might be. Um, but does that, does that answer your question somehow? Yeah, yes, yeah, so I think so. So in fact, the, the, the photon has a frequency which is probably in middle between the two control frequency, I guess. Yeah, yeah. well, I think, I mean, I think there are really two, two cohorts of photons, some going one way and some going the other way, and they have different frequencies. Okay. Yeah. And the photon actually spend most of this time uh, in the mirror. I think right. so. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'd say so. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, are there more questions from? Uh, the audience. Uh, okay, maybe, maybe one one. Uh, so, so again, so if, uh, so anybody in the audience has a question, just unmute yourself. I think that's that's possible. And and hey guys. right. Um, may, maybe um, another question. So for this, that's a machine learning you have um, shown, right? Um, mm -hmm. as, as you have mentioned, the that's a pattern which you get at the end does not necessarily look very intuitive. Um, yeah. I, actually, I, I can't really think about any any. Uh, yeah. Did um, did you do let's say um, sort of? Uh, and, and what I also think is let's say that the physics which I involved, right? This is not quantum physics, right? It's just classical physics mm -hmm. to a certain extent, right? It's uh, yeah. uh, rate equations. Yes. Um, did, did you do, a, let's say, a simulation with, a, let's say, rate equations and try to apply this machine learning? Or, I mean, or at least, I, I'm not sure what. So, but, get sort of a microscopic picture or something. Yeah, I think that the problem is that in the process, during this phase where, my understanding of this anyway, from speaking to um, people who know more about it than I do, which is um, a lot of people, I think, <laughs> but um, the... The, the, the situation when you're doing this compression, you've got the, the trapping beams on and the magnetic fields on and the atoms are getting quite close together. There's a lot of radiation trapping and exchange between the atoms and many body collisions. And the, the situation is very complicated. And to um, a simple rate equation sort of um, approach, I think doesn't, doesn't, doesn't work as I understand it. And the only way, the only way, I mean, you could write down all of the equations, but you'd have an equation for each atom and all the interactions between them up to some order of distance between them. And what I'm led to believe by people who I've spoken to about this is it's not something you could ever contemplate simulating numerically um, with any degree of accuracy. And so it's, 
it's one of the physical situations that um, is um, computationally intractable. And so the only way to for, for experimentalists to say, well, how am I going to trap the most number of atoms is somehow trial and error. Um, unless we come up with some other sort of heuristic model where, you know, I mean, the, the thing I said to uh, um, some visitors who came past who were real experts in this stuff is that my own intuitive model of it, it's like you've got a lot of marbles on a table. And um, this is going to be difficult on a Zoom call, <laughs> but you have a lot of marbles on a table. And the, the human approach was to sort of put your arms on the table and gather your arms in slowly and see how many marbles you have left over. And some of them start spilling over your arms and eventually you end up with a stable number of marbles. The machine learner is kind of going like this. It's grabbing at the marbles and bringing them in quickly. And the grab goes out and gets the ones that escape because it's sort of, sort of pulsing behavior somehow. Um, and, you know, people sort of, they, they thought, well, that sounds like a plausible explanation of what's going on here because it seems as though at some point it almost turns the trap off and then turns the trap back on again. So it, it, it pulls atoms that were sort of on the way out back into the, into the, um, back into the, the manifold. And you go, well, well, that's great. But um, how do I know what the best way to do that is? And maybe it's as simple as just having a modulated system. Like when we do the experiments and we, instead of um, dividing the time up piecewise, I'm really intrigued to see what happens when we, um, you know, start trapping and say, well, will will drive the um the trapping fields with some period and we'll try different periods and see whether some periods matter more than others maybe there's a period that just corresponds to the the rate at which the atoms are leaving the, the, the trap um because of their velocity and you want to wait till they're just at the edge of where you can retrap them and then that's when you cycle your system so maybe there's some sort of thing we can look at the temperature of the atoms as they as they're being compressed and find a correspondence between that and the, the cycling frequency that we have or something like this. I don't really know, but um, it, it's, it's certainly kind of intriguing. And it sort of, it, it seems to me there should be some sort of heuristic model that we can come up with if we think about it hard enough and do enough experiments that we can at least find a way of, of uh, if, if there's some thing about our system we can change so that the solution changes you know that would be the first thing to do is like what can we change so that we get a different machine learning mm -hmm. solution and what do we what do we learn from that we can change a whole bunch of different stuff and see if we start to see different patterns and so that's kind of the direction that i'm thinking we'll, we'll try and head there and see if we actually can yeah what's going on. to this i have another question so you said okay i put my steps at let's say this millisecond time step right mm. and yeah i'm not sure if i have seen this correctly in the graph but there were sort of huge variations in the time steps in terms of um value or whatever it, 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 it was right so if you would actually change the time step even more would let's say this huge variation there are new time step uh or there would be a let's say new new huge variation there are new time step or would let's say the old one persist so that you have let's say 10 time steps the same and then there's a huge variation are you saying mean having for, um, shorter time steps? Yeah, I mean. so if you would have shorter time steps, would mm. actually the pattern look exactly the same? Yeah, that's a good question as well. I think um, mi um, a millisecond is about the time constant that, over which we can change the magnetic fields anyway. Sure. Um, yeah, so okay. going much shorter than that wouldn't make much sense for the magnetic fields. But the, the, other, the other fields, um, that has been controlled by acoustic modulators, so they can go much quicker. But that's a good question as well. Yeah, I mean... Um, of course, if we did that, we'd increase the dimensionality of the space and yeah, 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 parameters. Yeah. And, and so, but, but again, I mean, that, that's another good question. I mean, maybe we'd find something different if we did that. And yeah, I'm hopeful in the new magneto optic trap we're building, we have a lot more flexibility. We should be able to vary the fields faster and we should be able to have higher magnetic fields as well. And both these things together, I think, will maybe shine some more light on the system. I'm hoping. Thanks, <laughs> Okay. Uh, actually, I, I have. Um, I mean, related to this discussion, I mean, uh, when you when you operate your your system at the end, I mean, uh, or with stationary value of magnetic, magnetic gradient uh, and the tuning and so on, did you see instability in your cloud? Because if you have a lot of atoms, uh, I mean, the, the the system can become unstable and show some uh -huh. some some oscillation and this kind of thing. 
We've seen some fascinating things from this mot um, because it is so long and there are so many atoms in it. Um, there was, uh, we spent some time investigating this coherent emission that we saw from it. Um, the details now are a bit fuzzy. I haven't looked and thought about this for a while, but we had the trapping beams on and then under some conditions when the optical depth was high enough, we'd see these bright fields being emitted along the length of the atoms. So you've got this, this long cloud and you have these bright sort of laser flashes coming out along the length of the atoms. And we investigated that for a while. I don't think it was really unstable, like the atoms didn't didn't blow up or anything, but I think in the end um, it was it was scattering, coherent scattering of the trapping beams along the axis of, of, of the MOT. It was very interesting. I think it had been observed once before in the literature and it only seemed to occur if you have a magnetic object trap which, which is long enough because you need um, the, the mm. spatial coherence along the length of the atomic ensemble. Um, but no, we haven't seen any sort of uh, instability where the, the MOT seems to sort of um, break up or anything like that, no. Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay, great, thanks. So okay. if there, yeah, thanks, uh, if there are uh, um, more questions from the audience, so are there any? No, okay, yeah, I mean, uh, students seem to be uh, no, that's okay. more quiet, yes. Um, anyways, um, so then uh, let's uh, thank Ben again for the nice talk and for the nice presentation. Um, I think there is a button here which one can press. I don't know, so here, here we go. Okay. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you for the nice, nice presentation. Yep, and when the uh, let's see, borders are open, maybe at some point when you're traveling around um, Singapore, I guess is always the place where you stop by. Yeah, yeah. Be a pleasure. Okay, great. Um, yeah, then thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah, thank, thank you for the talk. All right. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.